At last, the Prime Minister admits he did go to the Bring Your Own Booze gathering in the Downing Street Garden. Boris Johnson apologises to Parliament and the public, but claims he thought he was attending a work event. I apologise for all the misjudgments uh, that have been made, for which I take, Mr Speaker, full responsibility. This defence that he didn't realise he was at a party <laughs> it, it, it is so ridiculous. Also tonight, a judge clears the way for Prince Andrew to face a civil trial in America over allegations of sexual assault. Novak Djokovic confesses he did break isolation when he had COVID and... Come on, give me it. Ooh. Ah, ah, let's go, go. Ooh. The rewards ah, ah. of exercise. Mr. Motivator bounces all the way to an honour at the palace. TV Evening News with Romilly Weeks. Good evening. After repeatedly dodging the question, today the Prime Minister finally admitted he did attend a gathering in the Garden of No. 10 on the 20th of May 2020. Boris Johnson said he believed the party held during the first lockdown was a work event. He did offer a public apology, admitting there were things we simply didn't get right. And while Mr Johnson has spent much of the day batting away calls to resign, tonight they show no sign of stopping. Our UK editor, Paul Brand, whose exclusive first broke the story, has the latest. As the sun rose in Downing Street this morning, what light would today finally shed on what truly happened here? After 48 hours, at last Boris Johnson emerged to face that question, his premiership dependent on his answer. As he travelled to Parliament to explain himself to the Commons and the country. A near silent audience listened to what needed to be the performance of his career. Mr Speaker, I want to apologise. I know that millions of people across this country have made extraordinary sacrifices over the last 18 months. And I know the rage they feel with me and with the government I lead when they think that in Downing Street itself, the rules are not being properly followed. And it turns out we thought right. After weeks of denials, the Prime Minister admitted that he did go to a garden party mid-lockdown. He just didn't think it was one. When I went into that garden just after six on the 20th of May 2020 to thank groups of staff before going back into my office 25 minutes later to continue working, I believed implicitly that this was a work event. But, Mr Speaker, with hindsight, I should have sent everyone back inside and I should have recognised that even if it could be said technically to fall within the guidance, there would be millions and millions of people who simply would not see it that way. Among them, the leader of the opposition. Well, there we have it. After months of deceit and deception, yeah. the pathetic spectacle of a man who's run out of road. Yeah. His defence, his defence that he didn't realise he was at a party. <laughs> it, it, it is so ridiculous that it's actually offensive to the yeah. British public. Yes. Is he now going to do the decent thing and resign? Yeah. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to repeat that uh, I thought it was a, a work event. Downing Street claims the Prime Minister never got this email, leaked to ITV News on Monday, which called that work event socially distanced drinks, with staff invited to make the most of the lovely weather in the garden and to bring their own booze. In what other line of employment would you be invited to bring your own booze to a work meeting? Well, you're making all sorts of suppositions about the various different claims and questions well, that's that, have in the raised, email. that have been raised, and that's precisely why Sue Gray, who's a very senior civil servant, has been tasked to conduct an independent investigation. But not everyone's willing to wait. 
If Theresa May, watching on behind, ever wondered if karma would come back around, well, today some who sit on her side called for Boris Johnson to go. I don't want to be in this position, but I am in the position now where I don't think he can continue as leader of the Conservatives. For now, the Prime Minister returns to number 10, but there is little to toast there tonight. Well, I think there will be many asking this evening whether it is credible for the Prime Minister to argue that he simply stumbled into his garden across dozens of colleagues drinking alcohol, eating picnic food after 6pm on a sunny evening and for him to assume that was a work event. And when he admitted that he was at that party today, he wasn't just admitting arguably to the worst political mistake of his career but also potentially to a criminal offence. This evening the police won't provide any update on whether or not they're investigating but you might wonder this evening whether they do have the their confession. Paul, thank you for that. Well, the revelations about what happened at Downing Street have met, left many feeling angry and betrayed. So has Boris Johnson done enough to satisfy those who voted for him and to shore up his position? Ben Chapman has been gauging public reaction to the Prime Minister's comments. Most people had better things to do than watch Boris Johnson squirming in the Commons. But even in the solidly blue surroundings of Solihull... Mr Speaker, I want to apologise. ..loyal Conservative voters were unimpressed when they caught up. I don't trust him anymore. I'm Neither sorry. do I, no. no. There's no trust. No. Why didn't he have the guts to do this before? Because he's just been caught out. Because he's yeah. been caught? Exactly, Margaret, yeah. yeah. The thing is, it should never have happened in the first place, yeah. so, you know, an apology is not going to do anything. Would you vote for him again? No, I'm, I'm not sure, no. I would vote for the party again, yeah. providing he's not our leader. And I understand the anger, the rage that they feel... I don't think you do. Uh, Hugh Palmer believes his mother would have taken a similar view of the Prime Minister's words today. Paddy Palmer was a big supporter before she died in August 2020, two months after her twin grandchildren were born. My mum never actually got to hold them, to touch them. She, she saw them through the window. So an apology isn't enough. I want to see, I want to see a, a real difference in the way that politics is conducted and that the way that people who are, you know, in positions of authority and responsibility um, act accordingly. <laughs> Whatever drinks were or were not enjoyed in Downing Street, it's Conservative activists who will have to explain it on the doorstep. Students Patrick and Will are divided on whether their leader should stay. He's just found himself in a position where he can't get out of it. And I, I think the party would be better just kind of make complete change. Should he go? No, I think he's done, overall looking over the last what, three years now, um, he's done a lot more good than bad. But ultimately, his future is in the hands of voters in places like this and the Conservative Party sensing he may no longer be a winner. Ben Chapman, ITV News, Solihull. To our political editor, Robert Peston now, who is preparing for his show in West London. Robert, how do you assess the Prime Minister's position after this apology? Very weakened. Uh, I mean, let's just look at one of the things that he said, which is he thought that he was at a work event. Well, you know, I, frankly, May 2020 feels like yesterday for many of us. I uh, remember how constrained we all felt. I therefore looked at the guidance today and there is nowhere in the rules or guidance that says that at work we were permitted to get together, drink wine outside, uh, you know, in what, frankly, is to all intents and purposes a party. It beggars belief he thought he was at a work event and it beggars belief that Sue Gray, the senior civil servant who he has asked to investigate all this, will conclude that this was a uh, work event. So the big question now is if she finds that he broke the rules, uh, will he resign in those circumstances? Um, I put that to Nadim Zahawi, who's on my show tonight. We've just done an interview with him. He's the Education Secretary. He would not be drawn on any of that, simply said we have to wait for those conclusions. The stakes couldn't be higher for the Prime Minister. Right, Robert, thank you. 
Next, a judge in America has ruled a civil case against Prince Andrew for sex abuse allegations can go ahead. The Duke of York's lawyers had argued the case brought by accuser Virginia Giuffre should be thrown out on a legal technicality. The judge disagreed. Prince Andrew has always denied the allegations. Our royal editor Chris Ship reports. He had wanted the case thrown out, but tonight Prince Andrew is one step closer to trial. Or anyone else that has Today's ruling means Virginia Dufresne's lawsuit, alleging she was trafficked to Prince Andrew for sex on three occasions in 2001, will now proceed. Prince Andrew's lawyer argued he was covered by this document. It is a settlement agreement from 2009 when Jeffrey Epstein paid Virginia Dufresne half a million dollars. In return, she agreed not to take legal action against any other potential defendants. Last week in a New York court, Andrew's team argued he was such a potential defendant. But today the judge ruled he was not. The 2009 agreement, he wrote, cannot be said to demonstrate clearly and unambiguously that the parties intended the instrument directly, primarily or substantially to benefit Prince Andrew. So he decided the defendant, Prince Andrew's motion to dismiss the complaint, is denied in all respects. After this ruling, there is no logical stopping point between here and trial. So what is the process now that this, uh, this motion to dismiss has been denied? What's called discovery in America, that is the process by which documents and testimony are exchanged between the parties. Prince Andrew will be required to sit for a court-ordered interview on video where he will be questioned for up to seven hours of running time. Prince Andrew has always denied the allegations. He's also said he does not ever recall meeting Virginia Dufresne, despite this widely seen photograph of him and Miss Dufresne in the London home of his friend, Ghislaine Maxwell. Buckingham Palace said today it would not comment on an ongoing legal matter, but the Queen's son is heading towards a trial in the same year as his mother celebrates her platinum jubilee. Chris Ship, ITV News. Police in France say they've made an arrest over the unsolved murders of a British family killed in the Alps nine years ago. Saad Al-Hili, his wife Iqbal and her mother were shot dead on a country road in 2012. Their two young daughters survived the attack. A French cyclist was also killed. A judge has ruled the government's use of a so-called VIP lane to award PPE contracts was unlawful. But the High Court ruling did say that the deals would have been agreed without the priority treatment. The government has paused the development of smart motorways which don't have a hard shoulder following safety concerns. It's not scrapping the existing ones, arguing they will instead be updated. But that's little comfort to campaigners who say the move doesn't go far enough. Our consumer editor, Chris Choi, reports. They're called smart despite safety questions. Now, no new ones without hard shoulders will be started, but those already built still won't be getting emergency lanes. There was a big sign saying no hard shoulder for four miles. Claire Mercer's husband was killed on this smart section of the M1 in Sheffield when he stopped his car after a minor bump. A hard shoulder back in every single case is the only sensible thing because you can't control where you're going to have an issue. This one's been in and running for five years. Others have been in and running much, much longer. Why are we looking at the safety data now? Rollout of smart motorways in England without hard shoulders will be paused. There'll be a £390 million upgrade of those already being built, adding more emergency stopping areas and extra safety technology. Five years of accident data will be collected and analysed before deciding on further expansion. There have been 39 deaths on smart motorways like this that don't have a permanent hard shoulder. And up until now, there's been very little conclusive safety data. The speed which can easily be reached is so great that senses may be numbed. Hard shoulders have long been a basic safety feature, but government says restoring them would lower capacity, forcing traffic onto minor roads that are less safe. Now you're an independent expert. Are you happy to drive along motorways like this? I think 
it's it's undeniable that we that we've seen a, a a vast increase in the number of serious incidents. I do drive on them, but they're always something in the back of your mind. You do think, well, what happens when something goes wrong? Officials stress that hard shoulders aren't always safe, but campaigners against so-called smart motorways say their rollout has broken a basic rule of the highway code. Only proceed when safe to do so. Chris Choi, ITV News, Sheffield. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, more trouble off court for Novak Djokovic. And when Prince William met Mr Motivator. Those stories and more after this very short break. Welcome back. On the front line of the NHS in England, COVID is causing an ongoing staffing crisis. We'll be looking at hospitals around the country this week, and tonight we start with Chesterfield Royal Hospital, where there are currently 90 COVID patients. The hospital is in the Midlands, the English region worst affected by staff sickness. Almost 12% of the workforce are off half of the absences due to COVID. Well, our health editor, Emily Morgan, reports from there for the first of our Fight on the Frontline series. Hi, Diane. It just comes to do your observations, all right? Lindsay is checking on her patients, only they're not actually her patients because she doesn't usually work on this ward. So I normally work in education. You've been asked to staff this ward? I've volunteered to come down and help. Um, rather than see patients struggling, and have no one to look after them, I'd rather be here uh, supporting them and looking after them, making sure everybody's safe. In fact, this whole 16-bed ward at Chesterfield Royal Hospital has just been created to increase space because of pressures of COVID, our numbers are going up. It is, though, completely reliant on volunteers to staff it. This ward was open with about 12 hours notice, possibly less, um, and so we're pulling from other wards. We review it on a daily basis and staff it as best we can. Um, some areas of the hospital are better staffed than others, but nowhere is fully staffed. Um, but we just have to balance the risk. Despite opening this ward, this hospital is still operating at capacity. And of course, yes, they could just open another ward, but the problem they always have is staff. Without the staff, they can't treat the extra patients. And those extra patients just keep on coming. In the emergency department, staff juggle beds while caring for patients waiting for a bed in other wards. I know, I'm really sorry. It's, it's just so busy. Deborah's been waiting five hours. I just really need to go to a ward to get done what I need to do instead of making A&E busier than it already is. Mm. Charlotte's also having to deal with this while many of her colleagues are sick or isolating. Some days we have been five, six nurses short, healthcare short, the doctors have also been unwell, and so the workforce has been down a third, sometimes more than that, on a single day. Downstairs, all planned operations have been cancelled. Only emergency surgery is taking place, but even that is hard to keep up. Have, have you got to the point where you just think, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't actually do all these patients today? So a couple of weeks ago, absolutely, because there were so many people off sick. People are trickling back now. Have you managed to keep it safe for them? So far. So far. Chesterfield is doing everything it can to look after both its patients and staff, but you have to ask how long can they work like this. Emily Morgan, ITV News in Chesterfield. The prison sentence given to a woman who allowed her 16-month-old daughter to be killed has been referred to the Court of Appeal for being unduly lenient. Frankie Smith was jailed for eight years for allowing her partner, Savannah Brockhill, to murder Star Hobson. And rugby side Sale Sharks has confirmed one of its players has been arrested following an allegation of sexual assault. The club said the squad member, who hasn't been named, was detained over the weekend and is cooperating with police. Novak Djokovic's hopes of competing in the Australian Open still hang in the balance tonight. The tennis star admitted mistakes were made on his immigration form and that he'd attended a newspaper interview after testing positive for COVID. Our sports editor, Steve Scott, has more. Out of detention, his entry visa renewed and back on court, 
you could be forgiven for thinking Novak Djokovic had won his fight to defend his Australian title. But deportation still hangs over him, as today he was forced to confront some uncomfortable questions. Firstly, he explained that when he attended a prize-giving in December, he had not been informed of his positive test. The next day, though, knowing his result, he carried out a pre-arranged interview and photo shoot with a French newspaper. Today, he said, while I went home after the interview to isolate for the required period, on reflection, this was an error of judgment, and I accept that I should have rescheduled this commitment. Djokovic was pictured in Serbia on Christmas Day and then in Spain in the new year, despite his visa application stating he hadn't travelled in the fortnight before his arrival in Melbourne. He posted, My agent sincerely apologises for the administrative mistake in ticking the incorrect box about my previous travel before coming to Australia. He's got some high-powered lawyers acting for him. I don't think he would make admissions to incorrect information unless he was advised to do that by the lawyers. Djokovic's ultimate fate is in the hands of Australia's immigration minister, who is weighing up all the evidence, which seems to change by the day. Don't throw him out. He is a tennis player, he's not politician, he is not a criminal, he is not murderer, he is just tennis player, the best in the world. Just let him play. The tournament opens next week. Tomorrow the draw is made, and incredibly, there's still no guarantee that will include the world number one. Steve Scott, ITV News. Finally, in the fitness boom of the 1990s, Mr Motivator with his colourful workout kits became a popular fixture on British breakfast television screens. Popular even among the royal family, it seems, after Prince William revealed he was a fan when Derek Evans was awarded his MBE today. Martha Fairley reports. Derek Evans for services to health and fitness. He's better known as Mr Motivator, and apparently Prince William used to watch the workouts that have earned Derek Evans an MBE. I thought it stands for motivated by exercise, but apparently it stands for something more than that. And you know what, it's a great honour to be given something, in particular because I'm doing what I love. You are coming, let's go. Like Mr Motivator's <laughs> Technicolor lycra clad routines burst onto breakfast TV in the 90s. Here we go. With wife Sandra, he motivated the nation again during lockdown. And TV's most flamboyant fitness instructor now wants the Duke of Cambridge to get involved in his fitness drive. I then said to him, look, there's a strong relationship between what you have been pushing, which is all to do with mental fitness and the physical side, and the two things need to merge more. And he said, yeah, that's something that we should definitely be looking at doing. And he, I said, yeah, I'm looking forward to working with you to make that happen. He said, well, uh, do you expect me to wear a unitard? I says, well, so happens I have got one made up for you. He said, well, I think I'll leave that to you. I don't mm. think I look as good as, as good as you in one. And so do you think we're going to be seeing a, a Mr Motivator Prince William workout soon? You never know. Watch this spot. Wouldn't that be a great one? William and Motivator. Motivated by exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Still a man on a mission to motivate us all. Martha Fairley, ITV News. Unforgettable, those outfits. Tom will be back with news at 10 from me and all the team. Goodbye.